This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. On behalf of the College of Letters and Science and the University of California, Santa Barbara, I am very pleased to welcome our distinguished speakers and all of you to this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps. The history of the Peace Corps is in some ways inscribed in the history of UC Santa Barbara. Since 1961, more than 1,500 UCSB graduates have served in the Peace Corps, placing it among the top 15 uh, universities in the nation. And there are currently, as we speak, 38 UCSB alumni serving as Peace Corps volunteers in 25 different countries around the world. Our our graduates have served in each of the Peace Corps' six work sectors, and our pioneering environmental studies program has a particularly strong record of preparing students to work on environmental issues. And I also want especially to note that many of our staff and faculty, like so many residents of Santa Barbara, are also among Peace Corps alumni, and we're glad to welcome many of them here today. Now, there's a reason why UCSB is perennially on the Peace Corps annual list of top colleges and universities. Our campus is known for its global and international perspectives. We teach students about the languages, cultures, religions, histories, societies of the world, which also increasingly represent the global society of California in the 21st century. We typically send more students to the University of California Education Abroad program than any other UC campus. The same is true for our UC Washington Center. And we rank among the top schools sending students to teach for America and other highly competitive public service programs. We have a great tradition of civic engagement among our students. As busy as they are with their studies and often part-time jobs, they make time to volunteer in the Isla Vista schools, in local senior centers, in law clinics and medical clinics and arts outreach activities and in a wide variety of com community groups. The Walter H. Capp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion and Public Life in many ways embodies the tradition of civic engagement and social commitment. It has its own vibrant student service and internship program that places students in nonprofit organizations. More broadly, the CAP Center brings together research, teaching, and public programs to create a dialogue about community, citizenship, mutual responsibility, civic engagement, and public life. The same vision and values that led to the creation of the Peace Corps. These values were also exemplified by Walter Capps as both professor and congressman. In today's difficult economic times, students feel increasingly pressured to think of college as a vocational school, to specialize, to be practical, to be pre-professional, to think only about how college will prepare them for a vocation. I tell students that their college education should help them find their vocation, but the university is a vocational school only in the sense that vocation means a calling. Freshmen may know what jobs they want after they graduate, but they don't know what their calling will be, what will speak to them, how they might feel called upon to be an advocate for those who can't be heard. The Peace Corps is about finding that vocation, that voice, and it is a logical extension of the liberal arts education that a great public university can provide. 
So we offer our congratulations to the Peace Corps on reaching this milestone, and we look forward to another 50 years of collaboration and common purpose. It's my great honor now to introduce a great friend of the Peace Corps of UC Santa Barbara and the CAP Center, our own Congresswoman Lois Capps. Thank you. It's such an honor for us to have the Peace Corps director himself, Aaron Williams, with us today. Under his leadership, the Corps has thrived and continues to represent the best of America all across this world. Kevin Quigley is also here, the president of the National Peace Corps Association. And I know all of you returned volunteers have benefited from his tireless dedication to the Peace Corps community and are grateful for his support. These leaders are dedicated to carrying out the agency's mission, which has not changed since its creation March 1, 1961, by President John F. Kennedy. During my time in Congress, I've had the distinct honor of meeting with local Corps volunteers all over the world. It's a great point of pride and source of inspiration for me to represent a university and a community so dedicated to local and international service. I'm a member of the House Democracy Partnership, a bipartisan commission working with emerging democracies to strengthen their parliaments around the world. And while visiting foreign countries, we frequently meet with constituents of ours currently serving as Peace Corps volunteers. After each meeting, I'm struck by the same thing. These impressive, generous people are often the best ambassadors America has. They work hard, they respect local traditions and customs, and they devote themselves to their adoptive country, community. With each tour, these volunteers open minds and hearts to the generosity of the American spirit. Those unique personal contacts, some of which we glimpse today, are priceless and deserving of our unwavering support. While we reflect on the past five decades of the Peace Corps, we also look forward to its future successes. Tonight, today's theme, the future of international service, brings to mind all the invaluable work that still remains to be done. Leave it to Peace Corps folks to not rest on their laurels. So as we look forward, we must ensure that the, this Corps has the resources and the tools that they need to recruit and support the most talented volunteers and to find places for them to serve. We must take note of how our world has changed and how too many of our fellow citizens still live in po uh, poverty and surrounded by violence. And while the work volunteers such as you have accomplished cannot be measured, if ever more opportunities exist to grow and strengthen what you have started. Peace Corps Director Williams has shared with me and with several of us that the many, many countries are asking and asking to have Peace Corps volunteers come to their countries. So I thank you for your commitment to this institution. With your steadfast dedication and the enthusiasm of future and former volunteers in this room today, I'm extremely confident of the continuing impact of the Peace Corps. And I pledge my continued support of the Peace Corps at every opportunity I have in Congress and in our community. And I wish you every success. So on behalf of countless Americans, I'm tremendously grateful to all of you. Here's to 50 more years of Peace Corps service. Thank you. You know, it's been 50 years since President Kennedy met with students at the University of Michigan and asked a question that ignited a movement and inspired a generation. It was a daring challenge that he threw out tonight. He said, how many of you who are going to study medicine are willing to spend a few years in Ghana? And what began in Ann Arbor would change the way America sees the world and the way the world sees our nation thanks to the nearly 200,000 Peace Corps volunteers who have served in 139 countries around the globe. And now as we celebrate the Peace Corps' 50th anniversary and 50 years of promoting international peace and friendship, the Peace Corps continues to ask big questions. We want to continue to issue broad challenges. How far would you go to help someone? What difference will you make? In helping others to lift their lives, how will your life be transformed? Times have changed, of course, but the needs persist, and in many ways, they have grown. The inequities that existed a half a century ago, poverty, disease, illiteracy, and hunger, still loom large in far too many parts of our world, often exacerbated by contemporary challenges from climate change to HIV AIDS. 
At the same time, we have tremendous new tools and opportunities to seize in a world where nations and peoples are more interconnected than ever before. I remember that when I served in the Peace Corps in the late 1960s, I stayed in touch with my mother by writing letters. Remember letters? <laughs> he had to put stamps on them, pieces of paper. I walked to the local post office and sent the letter off to my mother in Chicago, hoping that she'd get the letter and I could schedule an appointment to call her a month later. What a world, huh? Today, however, the vast majority of our volunteers around the world have cell phones. They email, they blog, they Skype, they text, they tweet. They are technological warriors. <laughs> but you know, besides communicating with their family and friends back home, they're also using this technology to support their work in very creative and constructive ways. Last year, for example, volunteers in Namibia created a health education program geared towards teens and young adults. Volunteers use text messages to answer health-related questions, including on topics young people might be embarrassed to raise in person, such as protection from HIV AIDS. So I think there's no doubt this is a thrilling time to be part of the Peace Corps. It's a time of innovation and opportunity. And I'd like to offer three reasons why I believe the Peace Corps future is as promising as its past has been. The first of reason is because the Peace Corps works in a genuine spirit of partnership. It's captured in the very first goal that established the Peace Corps' mission, to help the people of interested countries meet their need for trained men and women. Peace Corps focuses on host countries' development priorities in partnership with government ministry and ministries and community organizations. Our volunteers live and work shoulder to shoulder with the people they serve in efforts raising from, ra ranging from youth development in Jordan to promoting computer literacy in Ukraine, to distributing bed nets to stem the spread of malaria in Senegal, or teaching health and hygiene to school children in Peru. And they focus on projects that are not only significant, but sustainable. So host communities, communities can continue these efforts long after our volunteers have gone home. Now, our emphasis on partnership conveys the kind of respect I believe our world badly needs. It's an approach that says the United States believes in human solidarity. We will continue to grow to support communities near and far. In recent years, we've expanded our programs for service. We've opened new programs, including Colombia and Indonesia, and reopened posts in post-conflict nations such as Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Today, we have more than 8,700 volunteers serving in 80 countries around the world. That means more Americans are serving today than any time in the past 40 years. Thank you. But it isn't just about the numbers and aggregate. It's about the individuals. We're making a difference, one project, one community, one volunteer at a time. Which brings me to the second reason I believe the Peace Corps future is bright. It's because we see in our volunteers the best this country has to offer. As Sergeant Shriver, our legendary and dynamic first director said, the Peace Corps personifies our best qualities and deploys to the world the vision of what America stands for. Generosity, compassion, ingenuity, flexibility, resourcefulness, self-reliance. And when it comes to commitment, the Peace Corps volunteer doesn't just go the distance, they stay. They learn the language, they live like their neighbors. They roll up their sleeves and they get to work. They represent all 50 states in a wide range of experience. Our oldest volunteer is a health educator in Morocco named Muriel. She's 86 years old. I don't know how she does it. She's amazing. She Skypes with her grandchildren, by the way. <laughs> and she recently had the great opportunity to meet with Secretary Clinton when the Secretary was traveling to Morocco. But many are recent college graduates eager to help those in need. They include 38 graduates of this university. And by the way, I have a very personal connection to this university because my Peace Corps training roommate was the, from this university, Dennis Krager, one of the first great people I met in the Peace Corps. In fact, this university has been a long producer of volunteers with more than 1,500 alumni serving since 1961. Also, now we are proud of people like Chris Fontanese, who graduated from here in 2005 and went to serve in Romania. After his first two years, Chris extended his service and now works with Romania's Habitat for Humanity, 
building decent affordable housing for underprivileged communities. For me, our volunteers personify hope in a way that speaks to the core of our character. The idea that whether or not one individual can move a mountain, we each have an obligation to try, and we don't have a moment to waste. It should make us all proud that in villages all over the world, people tell stories about Peace Corps volunteers who came and stayed. And in the process, they gave meaning to this word, America. The Peace Corps' second goal is to promote a better understanding of Americans on part of people served. I believe our volunteers are the best grassroots ambassadors that America can ever send overseas. Finally, the Peace Corps provides thousands of Americans with the experience of a lifetime, but also with a life-defining leadership experience. Time after time, our volunteers return home, they say the same thing. I went because I wanted to help, but I got more out of the experience than I gave. These words certainly resonate with me, as I'm sure they do with many others here who served in the Peace Corps. For me, the Peace Corps was the beginning of everything. It was the door to the rest of my life. I grew up in a working class family on the south side of Chicago. I was the first person in my family to finish college. My family expected me to do something practical with my degree. They wanted me to start teaching. But I found myself drawn to the kind of service that I had heard about in President Kennedy's speeches. So I applied to the Peace Corps. It was the biggest risk I'd ever taken in my young life. Luckily, my mother thought it was a good idea. She was the only vote I had in my family or in my friends in my circle of friends. Somehow my mother knew. The flights that took me to the Peace Corps Training Center in San Diego College, State College, and to the Dominican Republic were the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. I was 20 years old. I worked in a small town as a teacher trainer, helping 50 primary school teachers earn their high school degrees. For two years, I visited the teachers on horseback, on motorcycle, walking, to help them apply new teaching techniques. The teachers attended all day Saturday classes during the school year, and they gave up all of their summer vacations for two years. They wanted to improve, to access better opportunities, and I was determined to do everything in my power to help them succeed. So I worked hard to teach. I became their friend, their coach, and their colleague. But I also learned. I learned to speak Spanish. I learned about Dominican society. But you know, I also learned a lot about myself. And what I took back when I returned to the United States was a belief in the power of unity, that when we work together for a common goal, we can achieve magnificent things together. For me, the Peace Corps experience was transformative, and I am not alone. You go to any conference for international development, any public service summit, any U.S. Embassy, any gathering of civic-minded leaders like we have here today, you'll be amazed by the number of people who are returned Peace Corps volunteers. You don't have to go very far to find them here in Santa Barbara. People like Tom Tai, the extraordinary head of Direct Relief International, who served in rural Thailand in the 1980s and also held senior leadership roles in the Peace Corps headquarters back in Washington. Or Victoria Juarez, who served as a teacher in Russia and now works at the Storyteller Children's Center, a wonderful nonprofit that provides early childhood education for homeless and at-risk children. Or Robin Smith, Recreation Center Manager here at the university, who was a program director of the YMCA in San Pablo City in the Philippines in the 1970s, and who also pulled together this terrific Peace Corps exhibit on display in the Davidson Library. I'm guessing they'd agree with another returned Peace Corps volunteer who said, the thing about Peace Corps is that it doesn't end after two years. It really lasts a lifetime. They and many active return volunteers in Santa Barbara are helping advance the Peace Corps' third essential goal, to promote a better understanding of other peoples on the part of Americans. But that's not all. Volunteers return to the United States as global citizens with leadership skills, with language skills, with technical skills, with problem-solving skills, and cross-cultural insights that position them well for careers in many different fields. These are exactly the skills our country needs to build a globally competitive workforce. These are the skills our country needs to lead in these new times. That's why we're determined to continue to find and place the very best volunteers. We're looking to increase recruitment across all demographic groups, from new college graduates to retired professionals. 
from liberal arts journalists, engineers, and health workers. And we will continue to strengthen our investments in direct volunteer operations so our volunteers will have the best resources and support systems for their service. You know, we've come a long way since 1960, but our journey certainly is not complete. As long as there is suffering and strife in the world, we know that our work is not done. Fifty years since our founding, we honor our legacy. Not to retreat into history, but to renew our faith in the power of service to promote world peace and friendship. It's a timeless idea, as vibrant today as it was a half a century ago. The passion and hope, the empathy and enthusiasm that motivated volunteers in the 1960s still motivates volunteers today, and I see it everywhere I go when I travel to see these magnificent Americans around the world. So my great hope is that this vision will remain forever young, embodied in the idealism of the students on this campus and college students across our country, and in the spirit of older Americans like my friend Muriel in Morocco, who say, I have the rest of my time to relax. Now is the time to make a difference. In closing, let me say I envision a Peace Corps that grows and adapts to meet the challenges and opportunities of our time. I envision a Peace Corps that is still going strong 50 years from now. I envision a Peace Corps that upholds the noble ideas of Walter Capps, that works to cultivate common ground, civility, humanity, and hope. I envision a Peace Corps that carries the torch of President Kennedy's dream and responds to President Obama's call to service. For as President Obama has said, Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So what was originally called the bold experiment, some also called it the towering task, and we, of course, learned that it became the Peace Corps, still calls us to action. So let's see what we can do in the years ahead to build something together. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today uh, and to have a chance to talk about the, the future of the Peace Corps and the future of international service. Uh, but before I do that, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, how many of you uh, have been Peace Corps volunteers? Yeah, fabulous, thank you. Yeah, super. How many of you have been Peace Corps staff? Great, thank you. What about uh, parents of, family members of Peace Corps volunteers? Great, all right, well thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for your uh, service and ongoing uh, interest in the Peace Corps. And I, I feel so uh, lucky to be here today at uh, kind of a capstone event for a remarkable series of events that the CAP Center has, has put on uh, to help not only uh, commemorate, celebrate uh, Peace Corps' first 50 years, but really, uh, more importantly, I think, to think about how Peace Corps can prepare itself for the next uh, 50 years. And what I mean by that, how to advance its work of uh, making the world more peaceful and more prosperous. So before I talk about that, the second question is, uh, did you like those videos? Yeah. Let's uh, thank uh, Julianne Heyman, who made that, that possible. Uh, Julianne came to us, thank you, a few years ago and said, let's do a documentary about the, the Peace Corps. And we had a conversation and said, let's take advantage of some of this new technology that's out there, let others tell the story, and, and begin to get the word out. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you a short answer to the question of, of, of what the future of the Peace Corps and international service is in just a second. Um, well, I'll give it to you, the answer, and then, then three reasons of why I think it might be. I think the answer to the question of what is the future of the Peace Corps and international service is bright if we make it so, a very important qualifier. And let me talk about three strategies related to how we might do that. The first is uh, uh, raising the profile of the Peace Corps because uh, more often than not, those of us who are connected to the Peace Corps, when we talk about the Peace Corps, we get the response back, oh, does that still exist? A lot of Americans just don't know that Peace Corps 
exist. Uh, second, and this is a little bit of heresy, so bear with me. Uh, I th I'm among friends, but, but the idea is I think we have to enhance the Peace Corps model in some very dramatic ways. And the third is have to develop some strategies that really relate to uh, all of us engaging and supporting international service in kind of unprecedented ways. Let me just quickly run through each of those three things. The 50th anniversary gives us a remarkable opportunity to raise the profile of the Peace Corps. And, 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 and uh, with the help of the Peace Corps, just last week we launched a, a website uh, called uh, uh, peacecorps50.org. And that's a chance to, to uh, in effect, it's an online co calendar that's going to uh, collect all the events, including the, the fabulous events put together by the Santa Barbara uh, Peace Corps Association and other uh, member groups, other uh, individuals who value the Peace Corps really all around the world. Uh, that will be one place for events to celebrate the Peace Corps, again, keeping in mind the idea of advancing its work uh, uh, related to its mission. Uh, I'm thrilled that the Peace Corps has worked out an arrangement with the Smithsonian uh, that next summer in Washington there's a major festival called the Folklife Festival where roughly one to one and a half million Americans come to Washington, D.C. There are always three themes and all th three themes of next year's Folklife Festival, I think, tie in very well with the notion of international service. The themes are Peace Corps, the country Colombia, one of the first, uh, the pioneering Peace Corps countries, and rhythm and blues. And that will be a great opportunity to expose many, many Americans and people from other countries who don't know about the Peace Corps uh, to the Peace Corps. And, and, and for uh, the National Peace Corps Association, uh, one of our major efforts over the course of this uh, last few years, and, and Congresswoman uh, Capps has been a, a, a great ally and champion in this effort, uh, is to say that it's time that on our National Mall, which is the place that uh, captures and narrates our dynamic, evolving American story, and says to the world what matters to us, that there should be something about service about peace and understanding to supplement the memorials and commemoratives to sacrifice and war and our founding uh, presidents. And uh, the House has passed uh, authorizing legislation to do that and we're hopeful that the Senate uh, will do that with the help of one of our alums, uh, Senator Dodd, uh, over the next uh, month or so. Uh, so uh, those are just some quick ideas about raising the profile. Let me talk a little bit about the, the model uh, and, and kind of keeping in mind the inspiring vision of the Peace Corps was that 100,000 Americans a year would have the opportunity for international service. And, and it's fabulous under Director Williams' uh, leadership and the remarkable team of development professionals he's put together that we're at a high watermark for 40 years, uh, 8,600 serving volunteers, that's great, enormous progress. Uh, 40 plus years ago in 66, there were 16,000. Uh, uh, and so we really have a long way to go. But let's also kind of face reality. I, I don't think it was ever possible then, and even more so now, to get to 100,000 through a publicly financed, taxpayer-supported program. So we're gonna have to be very creative of how we get to that, that number. Uh, and, and in part, uh, I think this is like that Hollywood movie of Back to the Future, that in its early development, there was a idea that Peace Corps shouldn't be exclusively a government-administered program, that it should be administered by universities, by non-governmental organizations and faith-based organizations. And a lot of the early training was done uh, at university campuses like Rutgers. Uh, they trained Columbia One CARE. The International Development Organization had a major role in training, placing, and supporting serving volunteers. So in the future, 
Peace Corps is going to have to get back to the past in terms of really having substantive engagement with universities and non-governmental organizations. And one of the re most remarkable developments in this international service space is the role that corporations are playing. Uh, many of these corporations influenced by the Peace Corps model, like IBM, has a service corps that pulls together a multilateral, multi-disciplined uh, team. They go to a country like Ghana or Vietnam. They have a discrete project. They leave behind a deliverable. Now, it's great for IBM, too, because these markets like Ghana and Vietnam are markets that they see in the ascendancy. But they also are using this to train their next generation of leaders. And it's replacing their standard leadership training. Because the skill sets that these IBM executives learn about empathy, about teamwork, understanding other cultures, uh, are just essential to the company's uh, future and align precisely with their, their business strategy. So a model of, of Peace Corps and other international service programs that, that has real substantive partnerships with universities, uh, right in the training, helping training uh, volunteers, help support them, place them, uh, working also with NGOs and corporations in a way uh, I think initially envisioned but never really done. Uh, and, and I see enormous possibilities of having that kind of, uh, of substantive and strategic uh, alliances with other best of class organizations. And I think uh, Director Williams has a great skill set and, and uh, uh, range of experiences that should be really helpful in, in, in that regard. Now, how do we get there? And the only way we get there, I think, is through real engagement of the American people. And, and you may remember uh, back down during the 2008 campaign, there was just one appearance that Senator, then uh, Senator Obama and Senator McCain made, and, and that was for very symbolic reasons. It was New York City on 9-11-2008. And they were there to endorse uh, something that got enacted in May of 2009 called the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act. And that legislation was put together by a group called Service Nation, a coalition of about 300 organizations who were trying to expand opportunities for Americans to serve. Uh, and it succeeded, uh, and it was the greatest expansion of service uh, since the 1960s. Now, from our perspective, related to international service, the key element of it, uh, the international piece was stripped out due to congressional committee jurisdiction reasons. So some of us came to, together and said, all right, Service Nation was a great start. Let's finish that work and, and really expand opportunities for Americans of every age to serve. And we also know not everybody will do the 27-month the gold standard that the Peace Corps is, but they can serve with their church or synagogue. Uh, they can do a semester service learning program with UC Santa Barbara, a study abroad. Uh, they can do a year-long program with uh, programs like uh, World Teach or the Princeton in Asia program or the Peace Corps. Or once you've done the Peace Corps, uh, it kind of, it's, uh, we get infected. We want to do more. Not all of us are going to go back for 27 months, but we'd go back for a two-week assignment, a month, uh, three months, maybe a month, a year, over multiple years. So I think the model that Peace Corps has, has developed so well over the last 50 years will have to be enhanced by offering lots of different options, shorter term, longer term, and, and you, making much better use of international uh, communication technology to strengthen the work that's done by serving volunteers and make it possible to have highly effective short-term assignments uh, that have an impact and, and really add value to the work of a community-based organization or a sector, or to have these uh, individuals who served before be mentors for other volunteers. Now, uh, much like Service Nation, we now have about 300 organizations uh, working together. We hope early in 2011 to introduce something that we're tentatively call, calling the Sergeant Shriver Serve the World Act, and we think that's an appropriate uh, 
legislated effort to uh, really get underway during the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps because we think it has the potential to significantly expand opportunities for Americans of all ages to serve overseas. Uh, we all have a part to play. Uh, if you look at our, uh, our serviceworld.org, there's a pledge there modeled on the uh, petition that the students of University of Michigan put together after they heard candidate Kennedy at two o'clock in the morning on October 14th. And there was such a dramatic response that the campaign understood that the impromptu questions ch calling Amer young Americans to serve, that response was so dramatic that President Kennedy understood that this was something real and significant. So I think it's really up to us to uh, ensure that the international service uh, has a bright uh, future. I'm very optimistic and I think the 50th anniversary is a, an enormous opportunity for all of us who think that Peace Corps matters and values international service because how it contributes to our, the participants, the communities they work with, and more importantly, the, company, uh, the country they come home to, that it's a great thing and we should uh, increase those opportunities for all Americans. So thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to be with you. Thank you. One of the things you t didn't talk about, and I remember this because I've been following the Peace Corps since I was a kid, was that we were talking about bringing people from overseas to work here and creating that kind of relationship. And whatever happened to that, that's never talked about. Sure. And it was an important, I think a really essential part of what the, what the original idea was all about. It was like the fourth goal, I do believe. Mm -hmm. And it always seems to get lost in the shuffle. Sure. And I think I'd like to have you all react to that because frankly, my, my experience is I studied international education at UMass, did my graduate work there at the center. And we had many, many students from all over the world coming over. In fact, I was a minority being a US citizen in that department. And it was an incredibly enriching experience for me and I know for my colleagues. And I, I, I think the United States has kind of painted itself into a corner now and uh, you know, where we're exporting the military and not not the Peace Corps. So I'd like sure. you to respond to that. Well, Thank you. If, if, uh, thanks very much for those comments. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, expand a little bit uh, on my thinking about this and, and say that uh, um, in terms of that new model, it's very much as you suggest. It has to be two-way. In fact, uh, international service uh, is being internationalized, so it's becoming the common experience of young people everywhere. Uh, and also um, that I think there's some opportunities for co-financing, that it's, it's hard to believe or hard to imagine a world where the Chinese have uh, $2 trillion in a, the, in a sovereign mm -hmm. fund where we couldn't get them to significantly enhance their investment in a program that they thought added value to their capacity, i.e. a significant expansion of the Peace Corps. And, and your point about support for the, the uh, uh, Peace Corps in terms of uh, putting in the field 100,000 uh, volunteers. I'd love to think that was the case, but that's not going to happen until uh, the American people really value the, the Peace Corps. And that doesn't happen without us sharing our stories and ways to talk about the impact and the return on investment for taxpayers and, and how it relates to some of those other expenditures. I mean, I think that the uh, cost Peace Corps budget, even though it's much better than it has been at uh, you know, 400 million this year, that's roughly 21 hours for our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's because the American people so far have said that that's an appropriate allocation of our resources. So it takes us getting engaged to say that there are much more effective ways of being in the world. And I'd love to have 100,000 supported through Peace Corps and another 900,000 Americans doing service with their universities and NGOs and uh, corporations, et cetera. Thank you. I was wondering if the UN had any global international service um, similar to the Peace Corps. I think, was you referring to what you had to say, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the uh, short answer is that yeah. the UN does have opportunities. Uh, but typically, you have to have a college degree uh, before you can entertain that. As a matter of fact, we have a partnership with the UN volunteer program. 
and we're always looking for a couple of Americans or two or three who would serve overseas. But obviously, we're focused on trying to grow the size of the Peace Corps for Americans to serve around the world. But we do have connections with the UN, and the UN does have a have a program. Missy, uh, thanks so much for your interest in, in uh, the Peace Corps, and uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't, to, to uh, get some um, volunteer experience here in the community uh, and uh, uh, foreign language and uh, do some international service uh, either with groups like Habitat or uh, a summer semester uh, service experience and uh, a place you can look is a coalition called Building Bridges Coalition that there are a couple hundred of us who have short-term volunteer programs and I'm sure you can find one that fits your interests. What other role does the federal government have do you think in supporting service you know you know outside the Peace Corps to support these other organizations that you know that Americans are interested in participating and not everybody has 27 months you know there are there are a lot of reasons you know that mm -hmm. you know that that we we want to help and um, it's done largely you know outside you know the you know any participation in the government at all and it seems to me that the government really could help <coughs> more broadly but yeah, yeah I, if I, I can you know, talk a little bit about the, the role I think the federal government can and, and is already beginning to play to lift up the entire sector of which Peace Corps is an influential uh, leader, leader uh, um, kind of the, the model that everybody looks to. Uh, and, and I think President Obama began that uh, back during the campaign of talking about the importance of service generally. Uh, and, and so there is kind of a uh, raising of the issue in the national consci consciousness role that I think uh, uh, the federal government can and, and should play. Um, this service world legislation would help authorize some programs uh, that would supplement uh, Peace Corps uh, and, and, and providing that government imprimatur in some context for some programs can be helpful particularly if it comes with some uh, financial support, which I would look to be leveraging other, other resources. It can also help uh, in terms of the whole uh, issue of impact. I mean, one could say it's not just about, we all say it's not just about the numbers. You want those numbers to, to make a difference and to have an impact. So the federal government, I think, can help uh, related to issues of standard and assessing impact. So those are, some of the roles, uh, maybe Aaron has others, or among us, we could suggest some others, but I, I think those roles of the policy issues, raising its priority, uh, the, the model testing and adaptation, and then the best practices around impact are all very important. Thank you. This is not a rocket science. Finding ways to expand our influence around the world to create more peace. Uh, I'm going to put in a plug for the Rotary Clubs of the world. Mm -hmm. There are 1.2 million, mm -hmm. I happen to be a member here locally, mm -hmm. uh, 1.2 million members, over 300 countries, mm -hmm. endorse what the Peace Corps is doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, and whenever we go, we run into Peace Corps volunteers, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, the big program and, and our main source of money, for instance, eradicating polio, is, is, um, is what we raise, we're raising 150 million to match Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation, 355 million in order to eradicate polio. There are four countries left. We're working with the World Health Organization in creating this bivalent uh, vaccine because the most, two most virulent strains are still out there mm -hmm. in four countries. Um, uh, it's the business community. And there's, there, I know in my idea of the Peace Corps now is it's kind of in a, in a way outdated. You have this same static number of volunteers every year going overseas. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, 80 countries, maybe up to 100. In Turkey, we had, I think, 1,600 volunteers at one time. Uh, but the fact that uh, there's the business connection, there are 40 billionaires who want to dedicate half of their wealth to philanthropic causes. Uh, I see the Peace Corps is, is breaking out of that little mold. Sure, the one branch is, is, is these 8,700 volunteers supporting them. Mm -hmm. But why not reach out to other groups and other organizations funding research and, and, and uh, uh, for instance, I would like to see us nurturing 
uh, volunteer organizations in, in, in these countries. We, like when I left Turkey, I had a, a, you know, finally an engineer came to my village who was doing alternative service instead of the Turkish army. He was coming out and helping the villagers and he was much more knowledgeable than I was. But we have so many places we can go outside of our original model of servicing these 8,700 volunteers, reaching out to other organizations, nonprofits are a huge source of funding. And if you can do that, if you can reach, and, and, and do you know how many, Kevin, how many NGO people work in NGOs around the world by chance? Um, all together. Yeah, besides our 8,700, how many NGOs are there and how many people work in them? Heifer International, yeah. all of those that are doing the same work? Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish up with just, we're funding three Congo women's projects in Eastern Congo, Bakuvu, on the border of Rwanda, and that is, uh, we've raised uh, 62,000 in our last grant, 50,000 in the two grants before. We were building shelters for these abused women. Uh, taking care of their orphaned kids. You know, they can't go back to the villages when they've been raped, for instance, in the Civil War. So we're, we're building uh, shelters for them, a vocational school for them to teach them other skills. Uh, and that's, so that's a plug for Rotary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, first of all, thank you <laughs> for, that, for that comment. And um, Rotary is doing great work, and I see it everywhere around the world. Let me just say that I don't think it's an either-or situation. Uh, I would love to entertain a partnership with Rotary International. So if uh, I'd like, be happy to talk to you later about that or we can talk uh, by phone. I think it's a wonderful idea. As a matter of fact, one of my initiatives uh, since I've been director of the Peace Corps is to create new partnerships w across a wide variety of organizations. Uh, first of all, we are now engaged in conversation with the leading international development NGOs in the world. And we are developing global arrangements with them because guess what? And you know this, the ones of you who have served in the Peace Corps, for many, many years, Peace Corps volunteers have served uh, with NGOs around the world on an ad hoc basis. So I feel it's now time for us to have formal arrangements on a global basis so that our country, our respective country directors in a Uganda, in Mali, in Cambodia, uh, in the Dominican Republic can sit down and determine what might be the best customized program that can fulfill the priorities of that country based on our partnership there. And so we're working very closely. As a matter of fact, the first couple of months, uh, my chief of staff and I met with probably seven CEOs of the leading NGOs in the world. They were all enthusiastic about working with the Peace Corps. Now, that's not surprising because we've been doing it for many years, but also it's not surprising because guess what? Many of their senior leaders are returned Peace Corps volunteers. And so they welcome this kind of a partnership. So we're more than open. I'd love to talk to Rotary about that. I know they're doing fine work around the world. But I don't think it's an either-or situation that the Peace Corps model shouldn't move forward because there's also all these other players in the world. We need to figure out how we can join hands, work together, and look at the multipliers so we can continue to build this kind of strength and let as many Americans participate in service around the world. Because as I said earlier, I want to grow the pie, and Peace Corps is a part of that. I've known a lot about Peace Corps for a long time. It, but I've, I've always been a little curious how it works that peace, countries come to Peace Corps and propose working with Peace Corps, and then how does Peace Corps decide who they're going to work with and what volunteers they're going to supply? Okay. Um, let me give you a for instance. There's an island nation to the south of the United States that's had a very tortured existence and is suffering right now. We have reached an agreement with that nation that we're going to return to work there with the Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm very, very pleased about that because I, when I was a Foreign Service officer serving in Haiti, uh, one of the things that I did that I'm most proud of is that I helped bring the Peace Corps to Haiti at that point in time. Uh, we worked out an arrangement so that we received a letter from the President, President Preval, requesting a Peace Corps return to Haiti, and that's the first step. You know, it's very important, and, I, and all of you who served in the Peace Corps know this, one of the marvelous things about Peace Corps is that we have to be invited. And when we're invited, then we go in and we work on national priorities of the country, either governmental or organizations that work in the communities around the country. So now we're in the process of conducting an assessment as to how we're gonna return back to that country, what the target areas will be, both geographically in terms of our technical priorities, and so we're we're building the capacity to do that right now. The other thing I want to just uh, mention, which I think might be of interest to, to this audience, is that we have this wonderful arrangement called Peace Corps Response. It's a wonderful mechanism that taps returned Peace Corps volunteers who've already served uh, to 
come back and, and work on a short-term basis from six months to a year. We hope to go back into Haiti by using a large number of Peace Corps response volunteers, people already fluent in Haitian Creole and know the country and can make a difference immediately. We probably would not have been able to start up programs so quickly as we've done uh, this year where we've opened up in Colombia, Sierra Leone, and Indonesia without that capacity. So if it didn't exist, I'd have to invent it. So we look at, first, and getting back to your question, we look at, uh, first of all, the invitation from the country. We assess how we can, uh, the numbers of volunteers and the technical areas that we're going to operate in, and we work in conjunction and partnership with both the government and community organizations in that country. But one thing I will say, I think we mentioned it earlier, and that is we have a long list of countries that want Peace Corps to return. So to the extent that our resources permit us, we're going to continue to grow. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of being a Peace Corps volunteer, maybe for people in the audience who might be considering mm -hmm. applying? What are some of um, the greatest challenges, and, and what kind of person do you need to be to be a successful volunteer? Well, you know the thing that I look for in a volunteer and the thing that I see over and over again around the world is, first of all, passion. Passion, passion for service. I think that's number one that makes a big difference, the fact that you want to serve, you want to make the world a better place, you want to contribute to world peace and friendship. Uh, secondly, I think a, a big factor in being a successful Peace Corps volunteer, and I'm sure I'm on pretty safe ground here, is that you have to have an inordinate amount of patience. You know, what my grandmother once told me that the good Lord gave me two ears and one mouth, and it's always better to use the multipliers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I think that you learn, if you haven't already acquired that skill as a Peace Corps volunteer, to be patient and listen and to try to walk in the other person's shoes to help them understand, uh, first of all, to understand their, their, their challenges, their problems, and try to help them work out solutions that make sense in that context. So I think that passion, patience, and of course, the, the willingness to work hard. Uh, because Peace Corps volunteers work hard and all the time. Everywhere I travel, I see this. Those of you who have served, you know how hard it was. Sometimes you didn't even realize how hard you really were working to try to figure all this out. So I think those are some of the qualities that are, that are very, very important. If you have passion, if you're patient, and if you're willing to engage with people to help them solve their problems, you're going to be a successful Peace Corps volunteer. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Aaron has really laid out the list very well. I'd just add a, a couple of things. Uh, that I think are implied. Um, one is about learning their language, whatever it is. Uh, that's key, eating their food. Um, um, I often think those as the kind of the passport and, and the visa. Um, learning how to adapt, being flexible, goes along with being patient because things are never quite what um, you might think that they are or that they're described or things will come up either politically thing, political things or others. So you have to learn how to adapt to the circumstances. And, and, and um, in terms of the challenges, I think uh, the toughest challenge for most of us is just that's a long time to be away from family and friends. Now, it's easier uh, these days to stay connected. Now, that has some downsides because sometimes uh, volunteers don't seem to get as integrated into the community as they might if they didn't have their internet or their blogs that they were doing, though that serves a really important role. But, but I, I, th I think it's really the, the absence from loved ones that is the most challenging, and the sense also that you know, your cohort, your peers, may be perceiving to get ahead and you know our culture it's all about now 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 and you feel like you're falling behind so it takes you a little while to realize that now you were developing some life skills and experiences that are going to set you off on a very different uh, path but I, I would say those things what i want to know from you guys is for those of us who really do have a passion to do what you do uh, but don't have a lot of the practical skills that i think would be certainly useful in your kind of work, uh, what should we do when we graduate from UCSB uh, to prepare us for uh, what you guys uh, are trying to accomplish? Well, first of all, Jerry, I want you to apply to the Peace Corps, right? Yeah. So let's get that application underway, right? <laughs> We've got some people here that will sign you right up, get that application going right online. That's number one, because you've already indicated a commitment. Uh, secondly, while the process is underway, you know, start doing some community service. You know, it would be very helpful. It would get you engaged. 
and uh, will help the overall process. But I mean, I think first of all, we want to make sure that you apply. And, you know, you, there's a great tradition in this in this university of great Peace Corps volunteers, and uh, you know, one of them being my roommate in Peace Corps training. So I would hope that you would apply. I mean, I think uh, we want to encourage you to do that. Talk to our people who work here. I'm a UCSB a recent, a recent UCSB graduate. I'll be going to the Caribbean uh, to do environmental education in uh, 2011. And uh, I want to know- With, with the Peace Corps, right? With the Peace Corps. Yeah. So yeah. Peace Corps. I'm, I'm waiting for my invitation. It's kind of <laughs> nerve wracking. But um, <laughs> uh, I want to know if the Peace Corps has any institutional memory. So uh, I don't know what country I'm going to. So if I can like call somebody or talk to somebody and know what the other volunteers there have done. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, one of the interesting things about that question, institutional memory. You know, Peace Corps is fairly unique, I think, in the federal government that we have the famous five-year rule. You know, the reason that Sergeant Shriver created this rule is to make sure that we had an opportunity to continue to bring in new blood, uh, to let volunteers come back and have an opportunity to serve in headquarters and throughout the Peace Corps network. And it's worked very well. Right now, 60 percent of my staff are returned Peace Corps volunteers in headquarters. And of course, all of our recruitment staff. So. Uh, I think it's a great idea to have that, that infusion of new blood. And in terms of institutional memory, of course, that makes us different from other federal agencies. But in terms of your assignment and wanting to know about what has uh, gone on and uh, where you might be serving in the future in your specific area, sure, we've got plenty of people who can help you do that. We've got plenty of records and lots of folks who have recent experience, so it shouldn't be a problem. Just connect with our people. Yeah, and if I can mention, besides uh, connecting with uh, 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 the director and, and the agency folks, uh, uh, there's also the, the network of people who, who've been there before. And um, uh, depending on your country, do you know the country yet? Uh, I've done some research, probably Jamaica. Probably Jamaica. There's a very active Friends of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. There are, are a whole community of them. You can access them online through peacecorpconnect.org. Uh, and and uh, many of those may have been in the same site or a similar sector and would be a great resource. And another online uh, resource is P Peace Corps Wiki, where a lot of uh, um, folks on the way in or, or after their service uh, post lots of uh, project uh, and country-related information that volunteers find very helpful. Uh, plus, we, uh, like Peace Corps, have uh, in-country uh, uh, groups of volunteers who are there as a resource and at the Peace Corps Association we re recently set up a volunteer advisory council which uh, could potentially be another resource for you and 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 the great thing about it is I, I think probably lots like alum from UC Santa Barbara if a student here Jerry if if you're thinking about the Peace Corps or other kinds of things you go to a UC Santa Barbara alum they're going to talk to you, uh, and I think that's the same for Peace Corps alums. Uh, that one of the things that's true about all of us, if you get us talking about our Peace Corps experiences, we can't shut up. <laughs> well, Director Williams and uh, uh, President Quigley, we're so pleased to have had you here. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.